She served a prison sentence for her activities as a suffragette. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Ethel Smythe. Smythe was born in London in 1858. She figured out the basics of singing rudimentary counter-melodies to songs, and took after her mother's ability at naturally being able to transpose and play by ear. Her father, a general in the army, was incredibly opposed to the idea of his daughter studying music, but she didn't care. She began studying privately at the age of 17, although she had planned to do so as early as 12. This was her first exposure to what was then modern music. She battled against her father for control of her own destiny and only won out because she locked herself up in her room and refused to comply with any of the social norms. After winning the Battle of Wills against her father, Smythe traveled to Leipzig where she intended to study at the conservatory there, only to become disenchanted with the place in favor of further private study, saying that the institution was merely trading on its Mendelssohnian reputation. While in Leipzig, she met many important musicians, including Clara Schumann, Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky, and Johannes Brahms, the latter of which remarked, So this is the young lady who writes sonatas and doesn't know counterpoint. Smythe would go on to find Brahms quite abrasive and more than a little misogynistic to women he didn't already know. For his part, Tchaikovsky would later say that Miss Smythe is one of the few women composers whom one can seriously consider to be achieving something valuable in the field of musical creation. Despite her relatively late start into music, she produced a wide body of work, and one of her first early great successes was her Mass in D, something that she said sweated the dogmatic fervor out of her. Her opera Der Wald was the first, and for over a century the only, female composed opera to be produced at the Met. However, Smythe could be very precise, and this came back to bite her on more than one occasion. Most famously, she was going to have an opera premiered, but she objected to several unauthorized cuts taken by the conductor, and when these cuts were not reinstated at her insistence, she snuck into the opera house in the middle of the night, took all of the scores and parts, and skipped town. And when she changed orchestras, the eventual premiere of this opera was seriously under-rehearsed, and it wasn't nearly as good as it could have been. She was known for sneaking in amongst the orchestral musicians and slipping in revised versions of parts to performers, completely unbeknownst to the conductors, who would then become extremely confused when they would try to conduct something that they saw on their page and something completely different came out of the performers. Despite her exposure to all sorts of modern music, she held Bach and Beethoven, in the highest esteem of all. Like many female composers of her age, the fact that she wrote symphonically was seen as essentially masculine, and this was often taken advantage of when critics wanted to give her a poor review. Despite being rightfully hailed as a great composer amongst many musicians of the day who knew what they were talking about, she never achieved really true fame like many of her male counterparts did, and in fact she gave up music for several years to focus on being a professional suffragette. Her only musical activity at this point came in the form of a song called March of the Women, which then became an anthem for the suffragettes' cause. She was part of the Women's Social and Political Union, and when that group's leader decided that their members should throw stones through the windows of the houses of politicians who opposed giving women the vote, Smythe went through with it and she was among 100 women arrested. However, she stayed musically active through all this and even led a performance of the March of the Women in jail by conducting maniacally with a toothbrush. Smythe's personal life was full of torrid lesbian affairs, including unrequited feelings for Virginia Woolf and some kind of relationship for the harpsichordist Violet Gordon Woodhouse, instrumental, pardon the pun, in the modern harpsichord revival. For her part, Virginia Woolf said that Smythe reminded her of a ptarmigan. I can't make it out, Smythe would say of her attractions, for I am a very healthy-minded person. In fact, it's arguable that the only reason she ever threw any rocks through any windows or even became a suffragette at all was because she was in love with the leader of the Women's Social and Political Union. Either way, the organization halted its activities during World War I when Smythe went to France to work the radios. As you might imagine, Smythe made for a polarizing figure, and when she finally returned to music, she realized that she was going deaf, and she only completed a few more major works before going completely deaf. But her multitude of interests kept her creatively active and led her to the realm of literature. She was to publish 10 books, mostly autobiographical, throughout the remainder of her life. As she became known for her books, so too did interest in her music revive, albeit too late for her to actually hear any of it. Her death in 1944, at the age of 86, came after several years of illness 
and Pneumonia was the final culprit. Today, Smythe is hailed as equal parts talented composer and feminist icon. In all, she wrote six operas, a ballet, various orchestral pieces, six string quartets, as well as organ pieces and art songs. She also had a talent for sports, especially golf. I mean, I guess somebody has to like it. In her book, A Final Burning of Boats, etc., she wrote, The secret to happiness is to get your angle to life as sane as the imperfections of your nature will allow.